Hello everybody. Today, at long last, I finally get my mitts on the Mark II Ford Focus RS. Having already driven both the Mark I and Mark III, I've been desperate to see if this, the middle child, is actually, as some say, the best of them all. And while many would tell you this is the holy grail of hooligan cars, others now are claiming it's the next big thing in the world of appreciating classics. So then, which is it? Well, time to find out. relationship with Fords is a little bit of an odd one. For many people, it's a family affair. And though both of my parents have had their fair share of Fords, by the time I was growing up, they were no longer on our driveway. My dad was obsessed with the Mark I Capri, and though my mum had fond memories of her XR2 I, she certainly had no interest in buying another. We, like many families, had by that point then moved on to the likes of BMWs, Audis, so on and so forth. And so for me, a Ford was simply a car you bought because you didn't really care about your cars. I am also fairly certain it didn't help matters that I learned to drive in a Mark II Focus, a 1.6 ZTEC with the AA. And that was a car I never really got on with. In fact, when I recently revisited it, I was glad to find that actually it was just as difficult to drive as I remembered, and I wasn't quite as thoroughly an incompetent learner as I had been led to believe. Later, when I then had a car of my own, I started off with a Peugeot and, as soon as I could, progressed to a BMW. And as soon as I'd done that, it felt like any kind of Ford was going to be a backward step. And so, if my life had taken the path I thought it was going to, there's a good chance I never ever would have had the chance to sample some of the many delights of the Blue Oval. Luckily, things did turn out a little bit differently though. But first, my patent pending three point turn hill start torture test. Here we go. Round turning circle is not great. This car is a manual, as I'm sure you've probably already guessed. What's the handbrake like? Pretty good. Clutch, yep, yeah, not bad. Easy to modulate, easier certainly than the 1.6. And we're off. Visibility is pretty decent. B pillars, nice and far back. A pillars fairly thin, and there's a there's a lot of glass in this car. I like it. Back to the story. Thanks to this wonderful and crazy life that I now lead, I have had a chance to drive quite a few Fords and actually found a number of them that I really rather like. I have experienced the Capri in a number of different guises and um, it's all right. I'm not fond of the Capri and Capri owners groups are not fond of me. However, the Escort RS Cosworth I found to be a far more cultured and livable thing than I've been led to believe. Likely because the one that I drove was not just standard, but also not stolen. I have then also driven the wonderful rarity that is the Racing Puma, and though it is far, far too stiff and uncompromising for daily duty, it was a very memorable experience. I then also got to drive, in completely the wrong order, a number of Fast Focus, including the Mark III RS, later the Mark II ST, then the Mark I RS, and now this, the Mark II RS. Yeah, not everything always goes to plan, but I am here now, and I've got to say, despite the fact it's currently two degrees outside, the roads are a little bit slippery, there is a lot to like about this. For those unfamiliar with their modern day fast forwards, the two nameplates you'll see most commonly are the ST and the RS, with the latter, for rally sport, being those of the highest performance. There isn't always an RS in the lineup, and in fact, for some models, there isn't always an ST. However, when they do appear, they tend to be generally very well regarded. Part of that, I think, is because the models on which they are based are already fairly good. Much of this has to do with the input of the late but great Richard Parry Jones. In fact, I would go so far as to say, and I'm sure many would agree, that his input was instrumental in making the Mark I Focus such a revolutionary car, because even the regular ones were a fabulous steer. The second generation Focus was mechanically very closely related to the first, although it did grow a fair bit, making it a slightly more practical car, and it was also made to be a little bit more luxurious inside. Bear in mind we are talking about 20 year old Fords here, so it's hardly a 7 series inside, but it is a noticeable and appreciable step forward over the first gen. 
Today, the Mark I Focus in all guises has gone on to become something of a legend, and it also gifted us two fantastic performance variants. First, the Focus ST, and then the Focus RS, a car designed to ape the look of Ford's then very successful Focus WRC car. Both the first ST and RS were a success, critically and commercially, with the latter in fact outperforming even Ford's expectations. So it was fairly obvious to everybody that for the second generation they were going to repeat this trick. And in 2005 they did, giving us the second generation ST, which now came with a new party piece in the form of a Volvo derived 2.5 litre 5 cylinder engine a genuine USP in that market segment and something helping it stand out against the then increasing hot hatch competition. And the connection with the Swedish firm, for those unaware, was the fact that at the time Volvo were in fact owned by Ford, part of the Premier Automotive Group, which also included the likes of Jaguar and Aston Martin. Having given us a mighty and memorable ST, it then seemed obvious an RS was soon to follow. However, Ford made fans wait until 2009 for it, when this eventually landed. Although I have to say, I'm pretty sure there were plenty who felt it was more than worth it, because this really was a big step forward. And though in today's age of A45s, RS3s with 400 horsepower, wings coming out of the wazoo, and even the likes of Hyundai having a go at the hot hatch thing, this still looks incredible. Back then, it must have been borderline unbelievable. Sure, there have always been those that have accused it of being a little too max power for your company director. However, I don't think Ford really cared. They knew their audience and they lapped this up. Look at this from any angle and there's not much of a chance you're going to mistake it for an ST, and certainly not a regular Focus. At the front you've got a new bumper, grills in the bonnet, at the side bigger arches, at the back this nice big wing, a new diffuser and of course a pair of exhausts sticking out the back that tell you this is a car that means business. Making sure it has the bite to match the bark, you then had an uprated and reworked version of that 2.5 litre engine, now making 305 horsepower and 325 pound foot of torque. That's 440 newton metres. This was sent exclusively to the front wheels, disappointing those who'd hoped the RS was going to be all wheel drive, which finally happened only in the third generation. The interior was then given the RS treatment, including these gorgeous Recaro seats that are absolutely brilliant. A touch high for me, but otherwise I've no complaints. As this car has the Lux Pack 1, they're trimmed in Dynamica material and uh, really rather lovely. You have a six-speed manual gearbox, naturally a limited slip differential, and a version of what Ford called Revo Knuckle, the front suspension setup designed to try and counteract the torque steer for which a few fairly powerful front-wheel drive cars had become famous. They were available in one of just three colours, a white, a blue, and this, ultimate green, which to me is the only colour to have. Just in case you're sat there thinking, I'm sure I've seen them in black as well, that is the slightly later RS500 limited edition. Not long after the car was launched, much like the ST, people got a hold of it and started modding them, with crazy power figures appearing fairly soon after. And I think this is one of the reasons I've never really been that into these cars. For me, 300 horsepower is already a lot to ask of the front wheels, to say nothing of 4, 5, 6, or even 7 or 800, which some have claimed to have extracted from these engines. Though I must admit, I do always find it funny when people tell me just how great an engine they are because they can get that sort of power out of it. And then you say, oh, so um, what have you done to get 700 horsepower out of this engine? Oh, well, you know, nothing really. We've just replaced the pistons, the conrods, the cranks, the valves, the cams, the sump, the intercooler, the turbo. You know, it's, it's, it's just it's totally standard, really. Yeah, OK. And on that note, it is actually remarkable to see a car like this which is almost entirely standard. I've got to say a big thank you to everybody that got in touch with the Focus RS Mark II and many other things after my last video where I said I'd like to drive one. A load of you offered their cars and I'm really always grateful to those that do. This one though was just about the only one that I could easily get to which also was fairly standard. And here the only thing that is not original is the fact it has a Mountune MP350 kit. 
but I'm actually going to consider that as a standard thing, because for those not in the know, the mount tune kit was a thing you could have fitted by your Ford dealer, which in this case consisted of a new map, a larger intercooler and a new airbox arrangement, which took the power from 305 up to 345 horses and the torque from 325 to 340 pound-foot. What is notable about this is that Ford approved the modification and so cars fitted with it maintained their factory warranty. And as it happens, this is basically exactly the same power as the later RS500s made anyway, so Ford clearly felt the car was capable of taking it. Everything else though, wheels, suspension, brakes, they are completely standard. And you know what? I think this is a fantastic car. As you can see, we don't really have the day for it. It's now three degrees, but still, it's greasy, the sun is low, conditions are mixed at best, but this is the environment in which a car truly will tell you just how good it is at communicating to the driver. Because you see, these are the conditions where you need to know exactly how well that front end is doing, how much grip do I have. And this is fabulous. This steering is so good. It's really quick, it's really direct. The weighting is just about right, and yet there's information pouring back through the wheel. This is better than many genuine sports cars that I've driven, honestly. This era, there were two things Ford got absolutely right almost every single time across all their cars, the steering and the seats. And here, it's no different. Cars like this, hot hatches, I think are really crucially important, not just because of the social aspect of them, but also the fact these are cars that really do have to do a little bit of everything. And on that front, really, you've almost got to do two reviews in one. First off, how good is the Focus? And secondly, how good is the RS? Well, handily for me, I've recently driven a regular Focus, so I can tell you it's superb. I've already discussed the visibility, but rear room is pretty decent and boot space is excellent, likely thanks to the fact it maintained that front wheel drive layout. If you wanted, you could have had this car with the Lux Pack 2 that also gave you a reversing camera and a sat nav, but Joe, this car's owner, explicitly did not want one of those because it would have come with a rather dated screen. As he wants to try and keep this as standard as possible, he instead wanted a car without and has preserved the Sony head unit, which is very much of its time, but, you know, it works. The suspension is certainly on the firm side. Again, very typical of Fords of the period. They're always a little bit harsher than you expect them to be. However, this being an RS and looking the way that it does, I'm inclined really not to penalize it for that quite so much. I expect the customers of this kind of car were perfectly happy with that. The upshot, of course, is that combined with that steering, it gives you a huge amount of confidence to press on. And so, I know I've been blathering for quite a bit. I suppose that's what I need to do before I deliver my verdict on the Mark II Focus RS. Here we go. I like this car a lot. Now, it's not going to surprise you to hear that today it's really struggling to put the power down, but not anywhere near as much as I thought. The traction control light has been a near constant companion back there, but still, the car is still tracked fairly straight and true. You can sense it occasionally wanting to wander a little bit, but it's not been terrifying. I've had the confidence to just let it do its thing, and that engine is fabulous. Joe tells me that he's driven a few of these without the mounting pack and found they feel just a little bit sort of corked. You can tell the engine wants to produce a bit more power and I'm not really surprised. 300 horses from a two and a half litre with a turbo on isn't all that much. The power comes in at about 3,000 RPM and then stays strong all the way to the red line which is between about six and a half and seven thousand RPM. And on these roads, in these conditions, in fact I think even in the dry, I don't really feel like I'd ever want any more in this car. It's got just the right amount. It also makes a 
fabulous noise. That five cylinder soundtrack is beautiful and this standard exhaust setup is judged absolutely perfectly. You can hear it in here and when it goes past, you know it's something a little bit fruity and interesting. It even gives you the occasional pop when you lift off, but it's not obnoxious. As, let's be honest here, sadly, far too many of these are. Let's just see how quick this is, shall we? Let's slow down, do my sort of, you know, 30 to 60 test in third gear. So we're gonna slow down here to get to the top of this hill. Okay, yeah, there's some cars ahead of us anyway, so. All right, we're at 2,000 RPM, 30 mile an hour, and we're gonna get to the slightly warmer dry bit. Foot down, boost is in now. Yeah, struggling 40, 50, and 60. This is a quick car, geared nicely too. You can work those ratios, and the box itself is lovely. A little slow, a little heavy on the action, but you know when the gear is in, you know when it's home, it's beautiful. You can place this fairly easily, it still feels quite narrow because ultimately, arches aside, it's still a standard Mark II Focus and it works really well. There are only really a couple of problems as far as I can see it with this car. First off, they are already suffering from corrosion and when Joe got this, it had some on the rear arches, which is worrying considering it had spent quite a bit of its time in a garage. It is in fact a one previous owner car from new up until May of this year and also, they were really a cult hero the moment they were launched, meaning prices are very, very strong. Ford Mania appears to have touched quite a few models with now unthinkable sums being paid for Sierra's Escorts and today, the Focus as well. I've always said to people that the Focus Mark I and Mark II RS were going to be prime candidates for an appreciating classic. And it would appear this has sort of already come true because now to get yourself into the absolute cheapest, ropiest, scraggliest of either Mark I or Mark II RS, you're going to have to part with nearly £20,000 with lower mile unmodified examples going up for as much as 40 grand and special editions like the RS500 commanding more than double that in some circumstances. And I just can't understand that because I don't know what's special about the RS500 other than the fact it's a limited edition. There's just, you're not getting any more for that really. I, I just, I don't get that one, but still. Realistically today, both of these cars have now fallen into one of three categories. You've got the ultra low mileage, you know, sub five, 6,000 mile cars, which are original, hardly used, low owners. Those are your collector grade cars and they command big money. In the case of this, 35 to 50, thousand pounds and those you can't really drive and to be honest if you did you'd probably find they've got loads wrong with them because they haven't been driven then at the opposite end of the scale you've got the hundred plus thousand mile examples that have maybe gone through a whole bunch of owners have a load of mods aren't making standard power may have had a hard life particularly in the early days and those you're again going to pay about 20 to 25 thousand pounds for and to me I think that doesn't represent particularly good value because those are likely going to be the cars that also will give you a few issues. Sat then in the middle, you've got stuff like this at about 50,000 miles and essentially original, which to me is the way to have it, but usable enough because the mileage isn't super low and hopefully reliable because the mileage isn't super high and the car not modified. These you're looking to pay really about £30,000 for. And that's an issue because that's the sort of money that would get you into an Aston Martin DB9, V8 Vantage, Jaguar XK, a whole bunch of other interesting stuff. Toyota GR Yaris, sort of a GR86. There's a load of cars out there for that money. So you have to really, really, really like your Fords to pay that for one of these. But if you do, the good news is it's a good car. And I'm really glad to have driven it. I like it a lot. So then, there we go. That is a first look, granted, about 14 years too late, at the Mark II Ford Focus RS. I want to say a huge thank you to Joe for bringing it out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.